Hi everyone. Uh, in this video, I want to talk a little bit about threaded fasteners, um, threaded components, uh, but mostly focus on power screws. Um, I'm not going to spend much time talking about threaded fasteners, mostly because when we analyze threaded fasteners, we primarily treat those as um, cylinders, um, and we generally assume that the thread that it'll be sufficiently threaded that that uh, we won't have to worry about stripping the threads. Um, so we might talk about shearing of of uh, screws, but again, we're in, in that case we're only really treating them as cylind cylinders of a given diameter. Um, so with that in mind, power screws really just have, you know, more going on, more, more things of interest to talk about. Um, we shouldn't discount threaded fasteners, though. Uh, the book gives some interesting information where it talks about how um, screws, bolts, things like that uh, are probably the most common component that we would find. And it says that um, in, a, in a typical airplane, we might expect to find somewhere around 2.4 million threaded fasteners. Uh, and that it often represents 3% of the, the cost of an airplane. For, so for something like a standard, like a 737, that would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5 to $2.5 million in screws and bolts. So they're not something that should be, you know, taken completely, um, you know, lightly. Uh, they are important components. Just when it comes to examining them from a, from a, failure standpoint, you know, there, there's not as much um, new information for us to look at. So I want to talk a little bit about, about power screws. Um, power screws are threaded rods, threaded components that transmit power, um, turn torque into linear translation. Um, they also can be used for fine positioning, you know, so something in like a, like a linear stage, I might have a little dial that I turn um, that, you know, very minutely position something. That's uh, something I used to do a little bit in, in my PhD for some stuff I was doing there. And it's really, uh, they're really just useful. And the one common thing that we might look at, because it's a good example, is like something like a floor jack, right? So if I have a screw type floor jack, um, it's useful because it, it's pretty easy to understand that we have a weight applied down on something. And then, uh, we turn a screw to raise or lower it, depending on what we're doing. So if we talk about threaded fasteners, um, the real key thing that we want to think about is how the geometry of the thread uh, affects, you know, what we're doing. And, and for a lot of things, you know, we might stick with kind of a standard Acme thread. And an Acme thread, um, really has a similar to like a screw profile, but uh, something like this. And a standard Acme thread is going to have an angle here of 14.5 degrees. So that's kind of our, our standard for this. And this is alpha, the angle alpha when we when we do our equations. So if we're taking a screw and we're using a screw to transmit a torque, so torque used to turn the threaded, uh, threaded screw into a force applied to something, um, we have to think about how we actually look at this. So let's say we're looking at, and I'm just going to kind of pretend that we've taken a screw thread. I'm going to exaggerate the angle here a little bit. But suppose we have a screw thread that we've unwound from our screw and kind of flattened it out. So we're looking at it. So if I have a, a screw and I have a thread that goes around this, you know, in a helix, and I've taken one turn of that screw and un unwound it and then laid it flat on my screen, it would have a slight angle to it uh, like, I've, like I've shown in the picture here. And this slight angle, so let's suppose I, I draw a center line through this, 
if I gave um, a triangle and wrote uh, and drew this out, I'd have an angle here, which we might call gamma. And I'm going to move this gamma because it's in the way of what I want to write next. So we have an angle gamma, and we have then a length, which is going to be uh, in this direction. And that's going to be pi dm, which you might recognize basically as circumference. So it's if we wrapped this around the, the, the shaft of the, the threaded rod uh, one time, we'd have one circumference. And then we have what we're going to call L, which is basically um, the change in position in the axial direction as we traverse one thread around. Now, another thing that, that we want to look at is if I, you know, looked at this from a side view, I'd have my thread like this. Now, I said up here that we have an Acme thread with a, an angle alpha of 14.5 degrees. Now, the, the trick here is that when I look at this angle of 14.5 degrees, Really what I'm doing is I'm looking at the thread from a straight on axial view. So I've cut through the thread, cut through the thread this way, and I'm looking at it from the side there. If I rotate my, my head slightly such that I'm looking at a cross-sectional view of my thread, like this is drawn, then my angle is, is slightly different. And the angle I'd have here I call alpha sub n. So it's just like a, like a very slightly rotated view um, of that thread angle. So if I want to think about you know, what it takes uh, in order to, to turn this screw and transmit, um, transmit a force, then I'd have to zoom in on a little piece of material sitting on this thread and kind of treat that as a free body diagram. So that piece of material has some, you know, weight of, of say my load, you know, using that, that screw jack, jack example, I have a weight of a load pushing down on it. I'm going to have some force of friction applied. I'm going to have a normal force where this is touching my screw surface. including an angle in here to, to rotate this out slightly to, um, you know, say like a, like a normal to the surface or to the ground uh, and then rotate it for my angle of my thread. And then I have some driving force, which is pushing this forward. Let's call it Q, but it, it, it's not really important what it is. So if I can, if I perform an equilibrium analysis of this in, in let's say the, the tangential and axial directions, I can use that to come up with, you know, my, my torque. And I'm not going to walk through that whole um, analysis because the derivation of it isn't really that important for us. But there are a few things uh, that are of interest. One is that we can calculate this angle alpha sub n as equal to the angle of our thread, which if we're talking acne would be 14.5. Um, different thread uh, pattern might have a different angle. And this angle lambda, which is basically the, the, the thread angle. So, you know, a horizontal thread wouldn't be very useful. It'd be straight across with an angle of zero, um, straight across our screw. That's not terribly useful, but we have some angle lambda, um, which is our thread angle. Then what I get as a result of this equilibrium analysis is if I want to raise my, my part up, I get something that looks like this. See if I can write it without making any sign errors. And 
so we can look at you know some of what we have in here we have the weight so that's our force or our load that we're lifting uh, we have our diameter um, over two and then we have a friction coefficient pi diameter again l which is that that um, change in position uh, as we lift the uh, one through one rotation cosine alpha n uh, over pi dm cosine alpha n minus mu l. And this is uh, to raise, to lower, we see basically the same thing with some sign changes. So raising a load versus lowering a load. And of course, we expect those things to be different. In one situation, we're fighting against gravity. In the other situation, gravity is, is helping us. Um, generally, uh, for this type of equation, we might expect a, a coefficient of friction in the, or for this type of application, a coefficient of friction in the order of uh, 0 0.08 to 0 0.2. Um, so that's just kind of a broad range there. And we also might have uh, bearing friction. So we have to have bearings for, for to be able to rotate something and lift a load without rotating the load. Uh, we have to have a bearing. And so if that bearing friction isn't negligible, we might have to add a term for bearing friction where we have weight again uh, mu sub c, which would be like coefficient of friction for the collar or, or where the bearing is, um, diameter of the bearing, and all over 2. So, great, we have some equations for raising and lowering. Um, we could also calculate efficiency. Um, it's on the page on, on Canvas or on our website, so I'm not going to on Canvas. So I'm not going to uh, spell that out. But we have efficiency that we could calculate um, in the same way. Now, I want to take a look at a little example. So suppose I have. Let's see if I can draw this all here. I have a screw jack, screw, screw jack, if I can talk. And that's my bearing. And sitting on this bearing is some sort of platform that's going to act as the thing that raises my load and up here I have my load let's call it a thousand pounds so this is where the bearing is so give it a collar diameter of 1.5 inches I have an interface between my my threaded screw and my collar that's going to ride up and down that and we'll say that the screw has a diameter of one inch we have a collar friction of 0 0.09 we have a friction at the thread of 0 0.12 and we'll say this is a, a, a one inch Acme double threaded screw then you know what we could imagine and again this is a kind of a, a rudimentary thing but 
let's imagine we have a handle attached to this thing and that's where we apply you know some force in order to turn this and thus raise our load now of course you know most likely this isn't turned by hand we probably have um, a motor attached to it and we're rotating it and and, and all that so what we want to then find is, okay, what torque do we need in order to lift this thousand pound load using, using our screw? So the first thing we need to do is we can look in the lookup table. I think it's table 10.3 in the book. And what we find is that for a one inch diameter uh, Acme threaded rod, we would expect to have five threads per inch. And this gives us a pitch of 0 0.2 inches. Great. Now, for double threads, what this means is that the, the L, or if you remember from my drawing above, that L is the, the amount of distance that I expect to move as I travel one turn around. Um, for a double thread, that's going to be equal to 2 times P. So because we have two threads going on at the same time, we're raising uh, our load 2 times P, uh, or in this case, 0 0.4 inches for one rotation of that thread. Now, we can find uh, our major diameter. Uh, if you refer back to some of our geometry um, from the textbook, we would find that this is equal to D minus P over 2. Which in this case then would give us a, a D sub M of 0 0.9. Um, Inches. And we can start calculating uh, from equations, lambda, and you know, referring to the geometry we had before, I can do the arc tangent of L over pi dm. This is just using that angle um, that we showed in the just a few minutes ago. So this gives me 0 0.4 over pi and we get something in the range of 7.63 degrees great small relatively small angle from this we can calculate alpha sub n that I've described so arctange of tan alpha oops cosine lambda And plugging in our values, if we're talking Acme, then we're talking tangent of 14.5, cosine 7.63, and this equals 14.38 degrees. So 14.38 degrees is not all that different from 14.5 degrees. You know, where I said that the angle changes slightly because it depends whether we're looking at the thread from a side view like this or from a side view like this. Because that angle lambda is so small, the difference is actually very small in those two angles. So it actually probably doesn't affect things too much, but you know, we still wanna be, be accurate. So from that then we can basically just plug and chug into our equation uh, that we just looked at. So without rewriting all the variables, we have our weight of 1,000 pounds two times uh, we were given our friction and Collar or uh, 
So that's L times cosine of uh, alpha sub n pi 0 0.9 cosine 14.38 minus 0 0.12 times 0 0.4. Now, because we're given collar friction, we can probably assume that we can't um, neglect that. So I have to add that term on. 1,000, 0 0.09 for friction, 1.5 diameter over two. And if I calculate all these values out, I get something like 124.6. inch pounds plus 67.5 inch pounds for the collar. So comparing those two, you can see that the collar uh, friction is not particularly negligible. Um, it's, you know, roughly 50% um, of the, the, the screw friction and, and what's need, needed there. So not really negligible. 192.1 inch pounds. So that's the torque necessary, and I used the, the ra raising equation uh, in order to do that. So that's the torque necessary to apply to my screw in order to raise my load, 192.1 inch pounds. Now, it's important to realize that um, the frictions here are typically like running friction, so it's, it's dynamic friction. Um, we can expect a little bit higher, you know, if we're starting from a, a not moving at all. You can probably increase that by about 30% um, in order to get the, uh, the starting friction. Now I could also look at um, what it takes to lower the load. So this was for raising this. Uh, we can do the same thing for lowering, which if you recall the equation was changing some signs on our, on our, um, in our equation. So I'm not gonna write that all out, but uh, I'll show the numbers here. What we end up finding is minus 4.74 inch pounds, which you might ask, well, what does that mean that it's minus? Well, minus would actually then imply that we actually have to apply a torque to slow it down. Otherwise, setting the weight on our, on our um, screw would just drop it to the ground, right? There's not enough friction there to hold it up. But this is the value without considering the collar friction. So we can add the collar friction in 67.5 inch pounds. And that, you know, in theory should hold the load. So we get 62.8 inch pounds in total necessary to lower our load. Now really, you know, that, that torque that we're putting in then, really all that's doing is overcoming friction in the collar, right? Um, because it was negative um, on the screw and we're just basically s assisted by gravity um, and lowering that down. All right. So that covers um, what I want to get through uh, for power screws. The main thing to remember is that, you know, we have to take some geometry into account. We, we have to consider... Um, friction, whether or not it's it's negligible in the collar. As we saw in the example, it's probably not negligible in a lot of cases, but, you know, it's one of those things that sometimes we neglect. Um, and then ultimately, one thing that was kind of interesting was that we saw, you know, it, it is possible that uh, we actually don't need any torque to twist, uh, to lower our load. You know, it can just, in theory, free fall um, if the load is sufficiently high. Um, it would just just push the screw down. Um, and that would be important to know, right? We'd want to know uh, whether or not it's, that's going to happen. All right. Thanks.